begin. Hello, everyone. It's very good to have you here at the online home of the Institute for Sustainable Heritage. This is, in fact, our first lecture of the year. The, the events from this year have prevented us from starting until now. So we are delighted to start uh, with, with Hillary. We didn't want to delay it any, any further. So we are starting um, very, very close to Christmas this year. And that's why we are especially thankful that you made the time to, to attend. Um, my name is Josep Grauvé. I'm an associate professor in the Institute for Sustainable Heritage. I'm going to be introducing the speaker today, but first, uh, a little bit of uh, housekeeping rules. Um, this is a Zoom webinar. The main means of communication with the speaker is going to be through the Q&A function afterwards. However, in this case, we have also enabled the chat because there are some interactive elements during the talk uh, and you'll have a, a chance to, to, to interact a little bit. Um, the talk, is around 45 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes of questions and answers. When you ask your questions, I would be grateful if you can briefly introduce yourselves, say, for example, which institution you work for, and that always helps the speaker a little bit understand where your question is coming from. That said, let's introduce Hillary. Um, Hillary studied, uh, in fact, with us, in, in UCL, the Masters in Sustainable Heritage in 2013. And, and this is where we met. I was um, in the second year of my, my PhD then, and I believe teaching a little bit in the Masters. And that actually became the starting point of her career in conservation, which is something that we are uh, very proud of. Um, she's been at the National Trust since 2017, having joined an ICON internship program first. In her role as Assistant National Conservator, she leads on Integrated Pest Management, or IPM, for collections and interiors, and also plays a key role in the process for prioritizing and apportioning funds for remedial conservation. She works alongside national and regional colleagues to support property teams in the day-to-day -day running of the Trust's historic houses. And if you follow her on Twitter, you know that she has a wealth of interesting stories and experience and pictures that sometimes I wish I could use all the time in my teaching because they illustrate problems very nicely. It's over to you, Hilary. Well, thank you very much, Yosep. I will just share my screen. I hope everybody can see that. Um, good evening, everybody. And as Yosep said, thank you very much for joining us uh, this close to Christmas. Um, I'm also very behind with my shopping. But anyway, there's nothing I would like to do more this evening than talk to you all about insect pests. I am indeed Hilary Jarvis at the National Trust. Um, and today's lecture is going to look a little bit like this. We're going to hear a little bit more about me going on from Yosep's very nice introduction, a bit about the National Trust, just to set that in the context and to talk about my role and how it works, and then a lot about these guys that you can see there and I just put our top five there for you to see and they, and they, they aren't ones that I'm, I'm necessarily going to talk 100% about today but they're, they're, most of them will feature um, but we will see a little bit of clarification my title refers to insect pests in the collections care sphere um, but very specifically my expertise is in the historic house setting and as, as you can see from this little photo here um, I talk about this quite a lot it, it's different historic house setting to mainstream collections care everything we have is on open display display and we are very often in buildings that couldn't be far further from um, a bespoke or purpose-built museums and galleries they're normally ancient building fabric very leaky water everywhere so there's some very um obvious challenges around the agents of deterioration that keep us very busy and that's why although insects can tell anybody in collections care useful things I think for those of us in historic houses they're particularly useful so I just wanted to kind of clarify that a little bit so the little bit about me well I started life you can probably recognize from that photograph it's Oxford Street in London I started life in a publishing firm straight out of university I edited books I'm showing you a few of them there and I caught the very end of old-fashioned publishing 
before we went digital. So my desk looked like that. And it really was cut and paste, as the phrase goes. I did that for a couple of years, but fast forward and for various reasons, I needed to move on. And I found myself in the city, London's financial quarter, still editing, but I'm now editing that stuff. Financial research, not quite as much fun, um, but a very dynamic environment. It was very busy, very pressured. And um, I think we're all learning to be a bit more honest and open about this. I quit in 2014 after about 15 years doing that. I was pretty burned out, I think. I wouldn't quite call it a breakdown, but you know, I think we've got to be honest, I was not doing very well. I was in a bad place. And I thank my lucky stars that there was some instinct in the me that told me I had to do something and make a break and make a change. Um, and I did. And that's where the Institute for Sustainable Heritage came in, because I decided on a career in heritage, which is something I'd had at the back of my mind back in university days. And in particular, I did the master's that Yosep has spoken about in heritage management. Now, any of you that have looked at master's courses for this sort of thing will know that there's all sorts and they all cater for very different needs. So any of you out there are thinking about it, my advice to you would be to have a look, a good look at them all and really map what they offer and then have a close think about what you want to get from it. Because in my case, I really like that kind of very broad overview that this MSC gives you a built landscape and cultural heritage. So that kind of holistic approach, seeing everything in a round, which is linked to the interdisciplinary nature. I really like the idea of that, that you'd be working with other colleagues and the course gives you a lot of training about how to do that and do that well. Um, sustainability obviously was a, a, um, a big draw for me, but personally, I think that should be baked into every course these days. But also, from, in my case, this was a notion that it was going to help me become the next generation of heritage leaders. And I'm not, I'm not a megalomaniac. I'm not talking about, I don't want to be the director general of the National Trust, but we all need to lead in what we do in some elements. And in my case, I try very much to lead for collections conservation in what's a very broad organisation, as I will be explaining in a little while. But after that, as Yosep mentioned, I, um, it took me a while really to work out what to do next. And I'll be honest, I was a bit lost for a while. But then an internship came up with ICON and the host organisation was National Trust. And that was a brilliant thing because I got to basically work with colleagues at the National Trust whose job was to show me everything they could about um, conservation but there's a framework around it and you also have a mentor from ICORN and there's as you can see here you write lots of reports and there is a, a matrix so these are the reports there's a matrix that you have to fill in every quarter it's constantly getting you to map out your skills and look at them in comparison with the Dreyfus scale and the skills that come from the standards that form the basis for ICON's accreditation scheme so it's always getting you to have a look at your skills, your development, find the gaps, make sure you're filling them. And I had a brilliant time. It was just, um, I raided my photo archive to give you a bit of a flash here of the kind of breadth and scale of things I did. It was 24 months, so I had a long time. But as you can see, I've got, um, we've got relative humidity. There's insect pests, that picture there, here. That's me lecturing at the Natural History Museum, talking about IPM at the National Trust. We've got chemistry for conservators. We've got, that's me, um, what am I, I'm unpacking Visa Sackville West's reading room there for part of a move. Um, I'm here, I'm vacuuming a tiny little bit of fringe. I mean, I got to do all sorts of things. And it was great because I got to take the technical skills that I'd learned on the masters and then apply them in a very practical sense, but with that professional overlay from ICON. So um, again, found myself thanking my lucky stars again for that. And it was after that that I, um, you get a one year contract tacked onto you with the National Trust. Um, and by then I'd made my mind up that that's where I kind of wanted to work. For those of you that don't know very much about the Trust, I thought I'd briefly describe it. It's one of several heritage bodies in the UK. It's not a government body, but we are government uh, we're, we are governed by statute, if you like. There was a, an act of 1894, which was updated in 1907. And that revision kind of crystallized our purpose as it is today, which you can see there in that yellow writing, which is also, I think, encapsulated in our nature, beauty, history, uh, Twitter hashtag, which we've been using quite a lot now. And I think that really works very well. I think a lot of people tend to think that we're quite a narrow organization and we just look after houses. We really don't. It's actually incredibly broad. And our original philanthropist founders really, they founded us because they were really concerned about the erosion of ordinary people's access to green spaces as the industrial revolution took hold. And also the loss or the potential loss of traditional crafts and skills and ways of life. So there's actually a lot of landscape management. We own a lot of land. I think it's about 250,000 hectares, which I understand puts us in as one of the biggest single landowners across England, Wales and Northern Ireland, which is the extent of our remit. 
you can see some visitor and membership numbers there. We're, one, we're you know, by far away one of the largest membership organisations, Europe's largest conservation charity. And as you can see, I, with my little icons there, I've tried to break down perhaps more of the built heritage side of things. Even that is quite large. I work with the 192 historic houses. Sadly, I haven't spent nearly enough time in any of the 39 pubs. I think I've made it to two. I've been to quite a few of the castles. I'd love to go on one of the lighthouses, but actually my job with the 1 million collections uh, objects keeps me pretty busy. So then when we get to the houses, which is the bit where I work, again, I think we're far more diverse than many people think. And I have heard several people tell me, actually, that they the understanding is that historic royal palaces have all the grand palaces, the Hampton Courts, the Kensingtons, the Tower of London. English heritage have got the monuments and the castles, so lots of mass stone buildings and cannons and military hardware. And we got the country houses and the estates. Um, and that really isn't true. It's a huge generalization. And I'd love to take this opportunity to try and slightly dispel that myth. And I've put some of these images up for you to see that we do have ourselves quite a few castles. That's Powys up there on the left. If I can just get my pointer to work. We have certainly got some fabulous country house estates. And this one is Basildon Park, which you might recognize from various Jane Austen films. But Alfredson's Clergy House, our first ever purchase of a property, very humble dwelling, originally from the 13th century, literally one room with some bed sort of dwelling bedrooms that have been built on upstairs and downstairs there's a remnants of a very ancient traditional crushed chalk floor, very rare. We've got Beatrix Potter's house here in, in uh, up in the Lake Districts. And this house here is the country home of um, uh, Virginia Woolf and uh, Vanessa Bell. Uh, industry, we've got a couple of mills. This is a working mill, it's amazing. And you, when you go there and you hear the looms all working, making cotton, it's incredible. And there's a children's old Victorian school building there too. Back to backs houses. This comes from the Industrial Revolution, sort of trying to pre preserve remnants of how people used to live in those days when literally whole families, maybe two, would have lived in one room. We've got quite a collection of those. Right up to here, this looks like a 1950s building, but actually it's 1930s. It's the home of Erno Goldfinger, modernist architect. And more recently, we bought the two homes of, uh, the, of John Lennon and Paul McCartney in Liverpool. So really very broad and not quite as generalist as everyone thinks. So how does that fit and how does my role fit? Well, you need to concentrate a bit here because it's a complex organisation. And actually, when I look at this, I'm amazed that we work as effectively as we do. But we do. And it's all down to Venn diagrams, which I love because it's very we all work together and collaborate and share and all that. And I hope that comes across. But everything that happens in the trust, whether it's to do with beavers or rivers or puffins or ceramics happens regionally. It's very much a devolved delegated model. So all the work goes on out in the regions there. And if you're in a house team and you've got a problem, your first port of call is the regional conservators. So that green one on the left here. Um, there, are, there are currently 21, about to be 22 of those. And they all work with portfolios of properties. And there will be a curator and a building surveyor also working with them and others. But And they are the first part of, port of call. So if there's bat poo somewhere or a floor's looking very worn or there's mold on a painting, the property team will go to them and they will know enough to know broadly what to do or who to contact if it needs to be escalated. And in terms of escalations, they then work very closely with these guys, our senior national conservators. So they're not in the regions. They're part of what we call the centre where I work. And you can see there we cover quite a lot of the key materials there internally. So if there's a problem, they will usually know what to do or we might have to go externally. They'll also know that, too. Um, one of our senior nationals is this. I put it on the slanted here, the conservation scientist. That's Dr. Nigel Blades, in case any of you have ever heard of him. And I've slanted him across because he works with everybody. He works works with the regional conservators, the senior nationals, and he's got a national conservator and an assistant national conservator working with him on preventive conservation. And as I've already kind of alluded, that's a big deal for us because, as I said, everything is on open display and we're not in purpose built museum standard uh, buildings by, by default. Very excitingly, over here on the right, we've also got two studios these days. So we do quite a lot of our own remedial conservation. We have a textile studio on our Blickling estate and we have a decorative arts one on the Knoll estate in Kent. And that is quite new and it's really ramping up now. We've made about five or six hires there this year. And the ambition is really to be a centre for excellence for paintings, frames and furniture, decorative surfaces. And then we have one generalist who can do ceramics and ormolu and taxidermy and things like that.
Um, we're led by our head of conservation for collections and interiors and her responsibility is all these people. The regional conservators report regionally, but there's a sort of a dotted line. So we're all a big team in the end. And down the bottom here, this kind of green stretchy one at the bottom, that's me. Technically, I've got remedial at the end of my job title because as Yasset mentioned, I do a lot of work with prioritization of remedial treatments. And are we gonna conserve this state bed or these paintings? And I work with fundraising to help fund that. But I do also lead for IPM. And, of all this, I love my role. I think I've got the best job because as you can see from my then, I work with absolutely all of those people. And I think I'm probably the one who does that the most. And that goes back to what I said about loving the interdisciplinary uh, aspect of collections work. I, I really do get to see everything from big picture down to small detail and it's fantastic. So that's the kind of lectury part of my lecture done. And we'll be on to the meat of what I'm going to do in a minute. Back to Mike. But I just thought I'll briefly talk about Canary in the coal mine in case there's somebody perhaps not so familiar with English idiom. And I understand this translates into other cultures and countries, but um, it's a phrase that evolved as a bit of an advanced warning system in uh, the late 19th century after a spate of terrible catastrophes in coal mines where miners were dying from noxious gases poisoning them in the air. And somebody had the genius idea of taking little canaries down in cages. I'll just flick to that here um, so you can see. Um, and why canaries? Well, they are very small birds, obviously, but uh, they all have very high respiratory rates and metabolisms. So they're very sensitive to their environment. And if there's a hint of a noxious gas, they will quickly look very queasy and possibly even fall off their perch. And the miners got quite used to using them because it would give them, when they noticed this, they knew they at least had a few minutes where they could get out and get up into the fresh air. And they become very much part of the cultural heritage of mining, which I think is just wonderful. There are museums for them. And I love this. I saw this picture of a reviver tank, just in case any of you were anxious about these birds. So the handle at the top is actually an oxygen tank. So they could actually put their any ailing canary in the tank and turn on the uh, oxygen tank there and the birds more often than not revived. And they became good friends or, or, and pets, if you like, of the, of the miners who went down there. If you've had any experience with them yourself, you know, they're quite cheapy, che cheery birds, quite good pets. Um, and they're cheery colour also, I think, um, was a kind of a, a key feature. And they amazingly, they were still in use as late as I certainly found 1981, if not possibly 1986 in the north east of England, when they were then replaced by an electronic nose. I've got no idea what that is. But anyway, I've taken to using this phrase to sort of explain how I think insect pests in historic houses, they can be advanced warning of issues and problems or just interesting, useful information for us, which I will explain in a minute. Um, briefly, to take a step back and have a look at insect pests at the National Trust, we very much follow the English heritage model and we use this poster which you can buy if you want to and there's also a book which and they're very very good. I, we've never bothered trying to do our own because theirs are so brilliant but our house teams use these a lot for identification and there's lots of useful tips to give them information as to what they're seeing. But we are on the lookout broadly for nine types of beetle, four different types of moth, silverfish and book louse. And those are the main kind of synanthropic pests that have kind of made their or adjusted their lifestyles, if you like, to uh, from outdoors to indoors. And they've worked out that there is an abundance of food and lovely safe harborage for them in our houses. Um, so from that, we're going to go on to the bit. And this is where if you are feel like it and you want to put some answers in the chat I'd be very pleased to try and make this a little bit more interactive it's obviously hard to do in a virtual scenario um, but we're going to play a little bit of what's done this and we're going to start off with some photos some we'll start off with a very basic one and you are going to have the opportunity to tell me what you think did this and I'm going to try and adjust my screens a bit at the moment I can't see the chat which is a bit of a shame uh, let me see I hope you're having a bit of a look um, can I rescue this if not, we'll have to just, I'll have to hope. No, I don't think it's going to let me do that because I've got various screen sharing going on. Never mind. Okay, I'm going to rely on the fact that you're all jumping up and down with excitement, excitement and you are madly keying in furniture beetle, woodworm, anobium punctatum. I'd take any of those. You can give yourself 10 points for that. Um, this was found by me actually in 2017, slightly alarmingly, at Knoll House in Kent. There we are. That's what Knoll looks like. Um, what would it normally tell us? Well, it tells us that things are damp. And this is, came as no surprise whatsoever to us at um, 
Knoll because it was hugely damp since it was built and the oldest bit dates back to about 1400s and it, until 2015 we embarked on a major project it was not at all watertight it was incredibly damp and relative humidity was often up in the high 60s if not in the 70s and actually it was a good lesson to us that stability is often better than actual numbers because a lot of the furniture and panelling and paintings was perfectly happy because that's all it had ever known and we learned that when we loaned things to museums where they were or exhibitions um, where they were put under perfect conditions and everything cracked um, but to give you an example it's everywhere in the National Trust so that's a tiny little bobble on a bit of fringe in a ceiling and the furniture beetle can even get there um, in case you haven't seen one that's what one looks like they've got this rather beautiful wing cases with like pinstripes almost which are little pinpricks that run down them and I also love this shot because actually of all of them the Anobium punctatum really curves his head underneath so you often don't see it in that picture at the bottom you you it's just literally his thorax but there is a head under there and he keeps it well hidden and well protected so that shot gives you a shot of his eyes and shows you really what he looks like so if this was found if we found a bit of furniture with some new frass and new evidence of furniture beetle like this we would know if it hadn't we hadn't had any in that room before that we would need to take action and have a look at relative humidity we'd certainly isolate the object and get it away because there's obviously a live infestation there so my next image i hope you can see there there are three let me point holes there's a big one here we are and two smaller ones and i hope that you're keying in that you're seeing again furniture beetle or anobium punctatum and the bigger hole is death watch beetle and i again i spotted this and it sort of this speaks to this business of the national trust we've always got to be vigilant agents of deterioration all these leaky buildings you've always got to keep your eye you never know what you're going to spot um i spotted this this is actually on um it's in our stow gardens and estate and it's the chinese house which looks like that which used to be situated in the middle of a lake so we're already aware there's quite a lot of damp and water around and where furniture be beetle likes damp um sapwoods um death watch beetle likes damp hardwoods so this is a sign that this is made from both we've probably got some pines and probably got some oaks and mahoganies in this construct um i what that's oh yeah there's the beetles in case you, the death watch is much bigger and a bit uglier a bit of an uglier beast compared to furniture beetle i think and this is a useful picture because it shows you the difference in their frass now can you see there's, there's stuff that looks like the kind of sawdust we saw in the previous picture, but there's also more pellety stuff. And that's the death watch. So I was very, I've never seen it before when we've got both side by side, but it's a useful, I use this in my teaching quite a lot. So when my house teams are walking around, when they spot the frass, they can use this to say, if they're not quite sure from the size of the holes, the frass will be a very big indicator as to whether or not it's furniture beetle or death watch beetle. Either way, they can do an awful lot of damage. I apologize slightly for the picture. This is me taking a wobbly shot on an iPhone in a rather gloomy building. But this is at Mottestone, which is a wonderful manor house on the Isle of Wight. And I hope you can make out up here, these are two pegs that would have been part of the construction of this beam. It's a, it's a ceiling beam holding up the roof. And these are about, they're about two inches proud. So sticking out by about two inches, when of course they should be flush. And all of this has been eaten by both furniture beetle and death watch beetle. So it can show you the kind of damage these things can do. And I use this photo because quite often my advice to um, house staff is to speak to their building surveyor if they see something like this. And the building surveyors, when they come back to me and they laugh and they say, hey, Hillary, this building has been around for five or 600, 700 years and it's fine, don't worry about it. And then I tell them the tale of uh, HMS Trafalgar, the wooden ship that was sailed by Nelson um, down in Portsmouth and I spoke to the conservators there once and they told me that this being the Royal Navy they've got amazing records even better than the National Trust going back years but there were seamen employed on HMS Trafalgar whose job was to count emerging death watch beetles from their holes and document this and log this now there was a reason they did that and I don't know and neither do the conservators but I've got a hunch that it's because if you saw a lot more beetles emerging from one side of the ship than another it might be worth exploring whether or not some of the beams were looking a bit like this because if they were you might well have a vessel in peril so my mantra is never to be complacent our staff log this when they see us and they absolutely tell the building surveyor and it's up to them if they don't do anything about it so next we've had the wood borers what is this i'm really sorry i can't see the chat well maybe i can hang on let me do that no, I'm, I'll give up on that. Um, but I'm hoping that one or two of you will have recognised what's caused this. Looks quite scary, doesn't it? It's quite characteristic 
you know, you see that kind of grazing. And this tells me th th this creature likes to eat actually the mold on the surface of paper. But then what it does, what it gets, in, gets into it, then it will start eating. But that's why you get that kind of, it's like a tearing thing, isn't it? And it's had a jolly good go at this, as you can see. It, um, it says at Hewenden Manor, which is the home of Benjamin Disraeli um, up in Hertfordshire there. And this is, in case you hadn't spotted it, the silverfish. They can cause all unmeasurable damage. Um, and indeed, here we are, there's another terrible picture. This is some beautiful, it's very sad, beautiful 17th century Chinese wallpaper at Saltram House in Plymouth. Now it's historic damage, I hasten to add, but what's this telling me? And why, when I see silverfish damage, what am I thinking? And what, what's the canary in the coal mine signal I'm getting? Well, it's damp. And if, if you, I switch my next photo, you can see, just have a look at this. So we're up in the eaves here, right? This is the roof. There's a window frame there and a window frame there. And actually this is, if I enlarge this photo, we are here, up there. And what's just here? There's an enormous great downpipe and hidden behind this frontispiece here is an awful lot of guttering and rainwater goods. But it's not really coping very well with modern day deluges and it actually often gets very filled with leaves. So what happens? It gets clogged. And then the water tends to spill backwards. I can't tell you why, but it tends to spill backwards and go down and it just starts to seep into this stone and will eventually seep right through into the body of the building fabric. So it gets very, very damp. Silverfish love nothing more than slightly damp, mouldy paper, and they will smell it and suss it out, and they will get up there and they will eat that, and that's what they've done. So if this had been modern day, and we do occasionally see this modern day, it always tells me there's a new source of water that we perhaps might not have known about. And often it, say, it has actually saved us on a couple of occasions I can remember when there was indeed a blocked gutter or a blocked drain just on the other side of the wall. And we were able to spot it and stop it from getting any worse. So insects can indeed be canaries in the coal mine. What about this one? A bit of a trick one. And most people tend to shout out that they think this is silverfish. And it's not, but it's a good guess. But can you see, I'll point specifically at that, these holes. Because actually, this is our old friend, the furniture beetle. And this is a book that's been closed up and in a bookshelf against a slightly damp external north facing wall and a furniture beetle has found his way into the wood of the bookshelf and started munching and having a happy old time and he's munched right the way through the frame of that and he's hit a book. Well, it doesn't matter because books are made from paper just as the wooden book stacks are made from trees it's all trees it's all cellulosic so he's just kept on munching and you can see where he's munched through that hole and he's actually come through here and you can see all his frass but people often think that this is silverfish and it's not it is it's our old friend furniture beetle and I often use this as an, as an example of why latin names can be so important because obviously another word for this is bookworm but it's all the same bookworm furniture beetle, woodworm, they're all the same. So the Latin name is important because at times it can mean we avoid confusion because we all know exactly what we're talking about. Um, and I'll just put that picture in there to show people in case you've never really seen, but that's the kind of damage they can do in wood. That's what he's doing in this book. Not this exact one, but there we go. So moving on, what have we got next? Aha, I'll give you a moment to look at that. It's a very close up high definition shot, which can mean that it's not instantly obvious. Well, I'll tell you, this is actually a carpet. It's a 17th century Persian carpet. It's on our, it's a Blickling, which is a wonderful Jacobean manor in uh, Norfolk. And this is actually in the state bedroom. And I'm hoping that you're all madly typing in the chat that this is a certain kind of moth, in which case you're absolutely correct, and you'd get extra points if you could tell me that it was the webbing clothes moth. And I love this photo because yeah, we can see the webbing and it's a brilliant illustration of they are very messy webbing clothes moth. They leave a terrible mess, not neat and tidy at all. And I love the fact that you can see the frass, which is actually the colours of the carpets. There's pale pinks and blues and golds in this carpet. And you can see that in the frass and you can see the webbing left behind. And I've got another photograph which shows it a little bit more clearly. This is a bit of velvet curtain 
from Hewenden Manor. But you can again see there's not much frass. You can see the rather messy gnawing and you can see the telltale signs of webbing. And what does this tell us? Well, I'm afraid there's a very unglamorous truth whenever we have clothes moth damage of any kind. It's really all to do with housekeeping. This is to do with dust. We need to increase the housekeeping, really up our vacuuming, getting in there with the crevices and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think, you know, housekeepers of old, in the old days, they would have dismantled rooms in the winter and had what they call the thorough winter clean. And this is why they would have taken carpets like that, which they weren't fitted in those, they were rolled up, you would, they would take them out. And you'd have seen the housemaids would have been giving them a jolly good tamping to bash all the dust out and put them all back in. We don't tend to do that these days, not so much. Sometimes we do with these rooms at the National Trust. I don't do it in my home. I'm imagining you don't either. A bit more challenging, but this is why dust builds up. And as well as the eating the, the um, material in the carpet, they are actually eating the dust quite a lot of the time. So that's what you've got to do. There you go. If you haven't seen one, that's what they're. they are really very beautiful, tiny gold fluttering things, but they do cause a lot of damage. And that's what they look like on a trap, on a pheromone lure trap that we put out when we know that they're around. What about this one? Apologies again for a particularly grainy photograph, um, but I'm hoping you can see quite a lot of damage here. And these are actually, would you believe, George Bernard Shaw's knickerbockers, and that's his house, Shaw Corner. So he was the um, uh, 19th century Irish playwright, critic and political activist. Um, and it's not a very good photograph, I'm afraid, but I'm trying to highlight there, there are some little white tubes, little cases give you a bit of a clue and here's another picture with a showing them slightly more close up and if you hadn't guessed we're still with the moth but this is the case bearing clothes moth which is a kind of browner they're hard they're hard to tell the difference they're the same size but it's definitely a, a darker color can be a bit brown it's got these spots that you can see in that photograph um, and what does this tell us well particularly with case bearing clothes moth I'm sure this is very unglamorous I hope you're not about your eat your dinner but yeah, I'm sure you'll all agree without me being too specific that the damage here is in a certain area of the trousers and I'm afraid this is to do with human secretions because a lot of insects but particularly moth larvae they like things that have been soiled whether it's urine or anything else that we can imagine because there's enzymes in these human secretions that just soften the fabric up for them and they're quite lazy these things they'll go for an easy life so that's why they've gone for this bit and nowhere else because it's been nice and softened for them so the moral of this story both for you and for uh, in the past is clean your clothes chaps particularly if you're going to be putting them away in storage dry clean them or wash them whatever before you put them away because you're making life a little bit less easy for them they are amazing things unlike the webbing moths who are very very messy these are a bit neater and tidier and they actually make themselves a cocoon and the cocoon is also made often from the fabric that they've been eating and then what they do you can see it illustrated quite well here using his claws at the front he will move crawl along and move around and there's his where he's eating here but this is protecting him from any sharp bits in the textile or if I've been putting some of my chemical sprays out to try and get him he'll be protected from that so they're quite clever um, but again it's it's housekeeping isn't it it's keeping things clean and washing our clothes and not packing them too tightly into a wardrobe um, and you know just basically don't make life too easy for them so moving on a few more to go now I hope you can see that I'll give you a second to digest I can tell you it's the upholstered seat back of a chair. This is at Hewen, uh, Hewenden Manor, uh, Manor. I think I've got a photo of that for some reason. Um, and that's a picture of a similar, the, the same thing. I'll go back. Can you see whatever has been eating this has only eaten the blue? He hasn't touched the green or the gold or the red or any of this over here. No, it's the blue. This tells us several things, one of which is that there was absolutely a smorgasbord of choice for this little creature because he could be afford to be quite fussy. There's obviously something in the blue dye, and I'm going to get my textile conservators to have a look at this and tell me there's something in there that he finds particularly delicious. So he can eat that and then leave the rest of it. And people often, my property teams will often tell me, they, oh, we've got moth, we've got moth. There, look, they send me a photograph. Well, there's no frass, there's no webbing or cases. And this is a very determined muncher. And this is where I'll use that other picture. Another example here. They tend to kind of num, 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 set off in a quite determined way. It's not exactly straight lines, but whereas the moths go everywhere and do patches, this will set off on journeys. And this is, in case you aren't aware already, 
the larvae of the carpet beetle. We tend to refer generically to this little thing as the woolly bear, and I think you can probably see why. It's a bit more complicated than that because from this is an extract from that English heritage poster I showed you. There are actually four different types of carpet beetle, and their larvae are all quite different, but I've got about 200 people working in our houses who are doing the identifications of all this, and they do change. There's a bit of churn in house staff, so training them up so that they can really spot the difference between these isn't always very easy. And sometimes I just tend to get very pragmatic and say, look, we know it's carpet beetle. I don't necessarily mind exactly which one it is. If you see the adults, you can spot the difference. And some, some of them, when they get a good sample of the larvae, you can spot them. They all eat the same thing. They all like, like the clothes moths, they like the wools and the silks, um, but they reproduce very quickly and they can make a devastating mess. They're very hard to get rid of. What does this tell us in a historic house setting? Actually, this says, would you believe it, that we need to sweep our chimneys. And this is what I mean about this not necessarily being so relevant to a museum or a gallery setting. These things nearly always lay their eggs in birds' nests. So there will be something up the chimney or up in the attic space or maybe in a void. And it's not 100% not, not guaranteed, but I'm going to say eight times out of 10, that's what's caused it. And if you can eradicate that, sweep the chimney, clean it out, then your carpet beetle problem will naturally die away. So I hope you're beginning to see now what I mean about canaries in the coal mine. How did we learn that? We just did. We just worked it out. Um, but, you know, and that's kind of that, that's the housekeepers of old also in, in forming our modern day practice. Uh, yes. So carpet beetle, sweep your chimneys. I don't know whether that affects any of you at home. So my last example is not so much of a um, what's it telling us about a building, but a kind of a really nice, well, I, well, I, had, a, I had a wonderful time basically at our, tech, at our decorative arts studio, actually just a couple of weeks ago, looking at an item, and I'm gonna show you the item itself in a minute, but I'm hoping you can see this, this beautiful lacquered wooden surface, and it's got lots of furniture beetle holes in it, as you can see. And this beautiful thing is a casket. It was given to Rudyard Kipling and his wife by their daughter, Elsie, when she and her husband came back from their honeymoon to Spain, in 1927. And here we go, I will, there we are, there's Roger, and that's his house Batemans in Sussex, which is beautiful. And so this casket has stood, in, sat, sat on the same place on his desk, more or less since about 1880 something, to give you this idea about the National Trust and everything on, on the open display and not really moving and being in the same environment. Um, but it's got these holes, which I thought was very interesting. It's being worked on at our studio. This is Maria, here and this is our studio at Knoll and she's working on this um, casket which attracted a lot of attention because of its special lacquering this lack like, beautiful lacquering with a very symmetrical design lots of flowers and I hope you can just about make out this is actually silver it's very tarnished but there's a beautiful floral design here in the red can you see that which is very very beautiful we don't know what he would have put in it quite often people put letters or just treasures in it um, but it's at the studio so you see, Maria's going to see how much she can clean and lift that tarnish and bring the colours back to life. It's also got some very uh, fragile hinges, so she's going to work on those. But it's mostly here for research, because this is um, an example of something that's called barniz de pasto, which is um, a special technique that's kind of endangered. It was put on UNESCO's list of intangible cultural heritage in need of urgent, urgent safeguarding. This, this, this technique of barniz de pasto, which is known locally as moppa moppa, which is the name of the tree from which the resin used in the lacquering comes from. And it's an ancient South American indigenous craft originating from what we now refer to as Colombia. And there are, you know, there are a handful of these things around, but the day I was visiting, there was much excitement because we had visitors. And this is Maria, you can see her here. And this is Megan, who's our assistant uh, curator for furniture. And these two people are from the VNA, a specialist conservator and a curator. And they are here because they've got, need, got some mopper mopper. I think they've got seven or eight items, which are of a similar age. They're much cleaner. They've not been an open display in a, in a dusty, leaky old house. But they were desperate to see, when they heard that we've got this, they were desperate to see one that looks almost in its original state. So they came down and they spent the morning and they were having a fascinating time. You can see from this photograph there, we were using the microscope to have a look at it in, in detail. And I was the one who noticed that this business of going back to what, what's this got to do with canaries. If you look at this photo that I showed at the beginning, we can see all these holes. But you can see from here, there's no holes on the front. And I noticed that actually the holes were on the sides, but they weren't on the base, the front or the top 
which we all thought was very interesting. And then we had a lot of fun. And I'm just going to show you this because I thought it was really crazy. I'd never seen this before. We got the microscope and we zoomed in on the furniture beetle holes. And you can, can you see that? You can actually see teeth marks. I've never seen this before. I thought it was fascinating, really amazing. I've got another shot there, look at that. So that's one of those holes zoomed in with our Dynalite microscope and you can see the teeth of these little munching larvae. But why is it only on the outside? Why was the wood on the base and the front and the top not touched? We stood around scratching our heads and going back to, you have to think about what they're eating. And we know that an obium punctatum, they like softwoods, sapwoods, softwoods. They don't eat the hardwoods. So we had a bit of a conjecture that when this was constructed, the maker used probably one plank to make the two side pieces of a cheaper piece of wood, a simpler, more, maybe a bit more rustic piece. And there was a lot of make, do and mend. They were reusing things all the time. And the maker probably saved some more fancy hardwood for the base and the front and the more high profile pieces on the top. So that, that's an example of where looking at insect activity can tell us a little bit about the make, maker and the construction techniques that were used. And the VNA chaps who know a lot about this were fascinated by that. And they were determined to go back to the museum and have a look at their pieces and see if they could see similar things. But they've got lots of x-rays of their pieces to show exactly how they were constructed. And it kind of helps tell them, you know, a little bit more about the construction and how things are made. So one more shot there, yes, and I've uh, got a couple more. Here we are, look, there you go, there's the side piece. And I put that in just as a bit of a throw to show this idea of the heartwood of a hardwood and the sapwood. And this is how sort of planks are often made. So you can see how the, where the wood comes in the tree will, have a make a difference to its material characteristics and makers knew this and they used different pieces for different purposes depending on the strength or the glamour or the profile of the piece so um i think that's probably it was very helpful to the vna chaps to hear that they hadn't thought about that before so hopefully pretty much right on time you that brings a close my talk I hope you found it interesting and you have learned a little bit more about how the National Trust works and why insect pests are worth paying a lot of attention to wherever you live and work, but particularly for us in historic houses. Um, I'd be delighted now to stop sharing my screen and throw open to questions. Uh, there we are, stop sharing. Yes. Thanks a lot, Hilary. That was fascinating. Super, super interesting. We have plenty of time for questions and answers. Uh, just a reminder to everyone to use the Q&A function or the chat if you want. Whatever you use, I'm going to read it aloud for everyone to hear. It would be great. Sorry. It would be great also that when you write a question, you start by introducing yourself and your institution, if applicable. I can start with one question while I give everyone time to think theirs, um, Hillary. Yeah. Um, all this knowledge that yeah. you have, is it, is it all of it qualified? I don't know much about IPM. I know there are many IPM conferences and mm -hmm. books and so on and manuals, but many of the things you say are so specific to how a historic house operates right now that I imagine each heritage typology almost will have specific knowledge of what pests mean when you find them mm. there, right? It depends so much on the management context as well. In, in other words, you're not only talking about the pests, you're talking about the pest in a very specific management and historical and material context. Mm. Is this codified anywhere? Is it possible to learn it or, or you have to learn by doing? Yeah, that's a very good question. I, the honest answer is that you have to you have to learn by doing. There's a bit written about this in the Manual of Housekeeping, and there are a couple of practitioners' books. The one that I referred to that comes from the English Heritage, um, which is written by David Pinniger, and he's uh, written. I suppose he and Bob um, Child wrote the kind of definitive museum pest guide, and I know David's working on an update of that, hopefully for next year. So there's a, a bit of a gap in the market, maybe for a bit more of a manual. But yeah, you're right, and I, I I've learned a lot just since starting at the trust and talking to people who've got more experience than me and experience of different houses and different types of houses. Yeah, absolutely. So 
Sophie from the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna, Austria, asks, how often do you monitor your traps? Great question, Sophie. Thank you for that. Um, we have a quarterly monitoring regime. Although our staff are asked ever to be vigilant, most days they will be walking through the property and there's a lot of cleaning of the visitor route that goes on. So they will be vacuuming and dusting the main area that visitors go down. And while they're doing that, they're being vigilant. But the traps that we have out every quarter, they have to bring those in or they can do it in situ use a variety of identification sheets to do their identifications and then they fill in a spreadsheet and then they send that to me and that's my role is that I concatenate all the information from all our 190 odd properties and then I can take a look at the trends um, and that can be very interesting we definitely have different profiles in the east of England and the southwest and the north and the weather the different weather trends also has a has a big um, impact so it's my job is to try and keep a track of that I report back so I write a report that goes back to all of them and I do an annual report that summarizes um, with some charts and graphs like that but it's basically quarterly unless there's a specific problem and then we will maybe go for weekly or monthly monitoring while we try and work out the source of something and, and come up with a plan on what to do. Volodymyr asks, can you use this technology to predict long-term changes, for example, climate change and its impact on heritage? Yeah, great question. You know, we've been a bit tentative, I think, in the last five years about ascribing climate change because I think we need a lot of data to really prove that things are being driven by climate change but I would say in the last two years that changed and we're starting to be a bit more emphatic now that things are definitely being reflected in our houses because of our changing climate um, and one of those examples I think is web enclosed moth which I you obviously saw some pictures of and we know that this is a species that's not native to the United Kingdom although it's been here for a long time it was first um, noted by the Natural History Museum in 1880 and we think it was imported on animal skins actually from Africa it's a native species from South Africa, in fact, but he's been here a long time, but there was an indigenous native one, the case bearing moth. And for a while, and I'd say 2013 to 2015, it looked like that's when webbing closed moth numbers really started to spike. And it looked like they were going to almost eradicate case bearing closed moth at one point, I was seeing numbers really plummet of the one and shoot up of the others. But by 2015, that had stabilized. We've still got a lot more web enclosed moth than we have case bearing, but both are surviving. But we're pretty confident that the reason that case uh, web enclosed moth is thriving as well as it is, is because our climate is getting hotter in the northern hemisphere. It's also getting stormier and there's more moisture and our relative humidities are going up. It's also more chaotic and it's very comfortable in those kind of conditions. So. I think I am not quite ready yet to write papers on this and we need, you know, you, I, it, would, it would need PhDs and someone dedicating a lot of time to it, but I think their early indications are that yes, insect pests definitely could be helping. Mm. Yeah. Fascinating. Mm. Brigitte Hus, a social anthropologist, uh, asks, you talked about tassels at the ceiling being affected. How do you discover this? <laughs> Great question. Well, that's vigilance of our house staff and part of their cleaning regime. So they every day they, they are cleaning the visitor route. But depending on which house it is and how many staff they have and how many visitors they have, nearly all rooms will get cleaned thoroughly at some stage during the year, sometimes more often. So at some stage, somebody was up on a scaffolding with a little handheld vacuum cleaner cleaning those tassels. And that's when they would have found them. And they record them and document them. And then we make a decision on whether or not we need to do anything. But yeah, great question. Makes you wonder what they're not missing, what they're not spotting, doesn't it? But um, hopefully, hopefully enough. Another question from Nian. He asks, is there any relationship between these pests, like the existence of one type could provide a good environment for another type? Yes, that's a good question. Um, so quite often when we have carpet beetle, 
we will get Australian spider beetle. Now, I didn't talk about him today, but you all might have remembered that that's it. he's in our top five. Um, the problem is he's kind of a scavenger pest rather than being cellulosic or keratinous. He'll eat anything. He's a scavenger. They will eat. They'll eat. They also love birds nests, but they'll eat the twigs and they'll eat the feathers and they'll eat. And they we don't find much evidence of them doing damage. The problem with them is that they exist in such numbers and we'll find them literally running down walls. So it's more of a visual aesthetic thing. But where we have spider beetles, I, I, it's never a surprise to find carpet beetles because they're both linked to bird's nests. So if you know about one, you can keep your eyes open for another. Um, and the same a little bit with the wood borers. If you know that you've got something that's made of softwoods and hardwoods, if they've both been damp at some point, it's perfectly possible that you'll have both species. Um, I, I have kind of a follow up to this, if I may, on yeah, go for the it. angle of preventive conservation and environmental monitoring. Mm. Is, is environmental humidity and temperature a good predictor of, of risk? Yes. Yes, it is. But I, you know, and I, I say this with no small amount of pride. We're pretty good at that at the National Trust. So we don't have a, we have a conservation heating in most of our buildings now, but we have quite a wide band. This goes back to the point that it's not a museum and they're often leaky buildings. So our, we aim for relative humidity to stay somewhere between 40 and 65%, 90% of the time. So we give ourselves a bit of wiggle room, but actually our conservation heating systems, which mostly rely on the existing heating systems in houses, or we put electric radiators in, it's pretty good, pretty effective at that. So it's not, it's not, it's not common for me to find that um, we, a pest is an indicative of a, a specific relative humidity issue. It's more likely to be an isolated water leak or problem, Some, sometimes one that we haven't seen before. Um, but yeah, I mean, yes, in theory it is, but I think we've, we've got that pretty much under control at the Trust. Another question from A.D. Doyle, former IPM manager at the British Museum. Yeah, hello, uh, A.D. Have you noticed any changes to insect species activity and number during the pandemic? Yes, and that's has a great the data question. Recovered. Yeah, yes, yes, we have. We noticed a definite spike in insect numbers during the pandemic. And it didn't come as a huge surprise to us, to be honest, because we went from our houses being open to being completely shut. And I mean shut. So the, the blinds were down, the shutters were shut, so they were dark. There were no people going in and out. There was very little air movement. There was no disturbance. What dust there was was just left there to settle. And there was often that some of those properties that you've seen little pictures of, like on the Blickling estate, there were literally two people left operating there and they had to care for the outside and the inside. So there was very little activity. And in that, you could imagine, uh, they had a good period of time. Insect numbers definitely went up and they have come back. So we did see that. I will say, on the other hand, that I, we spoke to um, colleagues at English Heritage and Historic Royal Palaces, and HRP said the reverse. They said that theirs went down, and they think that that's because a lot of their insects, they think, are brought in by uh, visitors and are sustained by dust and dirt brought in by visitors. So if you take the visitors away, there was much less food source for them. So possibly surprising answers at two different ends of the spectrum, but that was their experience, and that was definitely ours. Can, can I ask further about this? Do you think there's there's any reason why visitors do not bring the same sort of source of food in National Trust property? <sighs> mm, that's a good question. I don't know that I've got a great answer to that. I think we've got a lot of we've got a lot more houses than English Heritage, and quite a lot of them are quite cluttered, full of collection. Uh, maybe there's less airflow, smaller, maybe we've got more smaller rooms. I don't know. Good question. Maybe I need to go in and think about that. Different visitor profiles, different settings. I don't know. There'll be, there will be something. I, I'm, I'm realizing that in IPM, we know a lot. The information or the knowledge we have help us take the decision once we identify a specific problem in a property. Yes. But there are many interesting questions in the aggregate. Right, both yes. in comparisons between properties, geographical comparisons, comparisons through time, and so on. Yes. Interesting area for future research, I think. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Justin Philip asks Do you use many chemical pesticides and have this had negative impacts on the sites? 
another great question. Thank you, Justine. Um, yes, we do. We use one kind of, well, mostly we use one kind of chemical, which is uh, water-based, but it is um, uh, uses permethrin, and it is made for us by a company that make it specifically for use with historic fabrics, and it's been tested on quite a lot. We're still a bit careful. We don't use it a lot. We don't use it liberally. We prefer to be preventive. But for example, particularly where there is carpet beetle attack, or maybe we've seen some moth, it's quite likely that we will spray around the edges of the carpet because we know that's where they tend to go. So we will do our best if we think the numbers are going to get out of hand to try and control that. Um, I'm not aware that it's caused any problems. We uh, some, we, we're toying with the idea of using a bit more aerosol fogging sometimes, and this goes back to the climate change issue. Pest numbers are definitely going up, supported, we think, by pest, by um, climate change and more favorable conditions. So we've got to be on the front put, foot. We've got to come up with, you know, we can't be complacent and let numbers go up and up and up. We've got to do more. We've got to have more tools in our armory. So in this next year, I'm hoping to be doing a bit more testing with foggers that release very fine particle chemicals that can be very, very effective. You, people use them in their homes quite a lot. We don't know enough about what the residues might do in five years, 10 years time, what the, res what the, what the impact of the residue might be on a, on a sensitive textile or surface. So we need to research it a bit more. Um, so the honest answer is we haven't tended to use it very much. We prefer not to. But personally, I think we're going to have to be a bit more realistic and consider all options. Thank you. Um, we have time for maybe one last question, and there are so many. So I'll have to pick one. Mm -hmm. um, there's one by Jasmina, who says a fascinating talk. Um, Jasmina uh, doesn't have problems with pests. Uh, in her work uh, because she works in ceramics so they are relatively mm. okay I think from pests but she does have pests at home yes. so asks for some wisdom uh, what would be the best and I'm summarizing a long question mm -hmm. but it says what would be the best strategy for a carpet moth infestation is there anything any any IPM that we can do before we call the experts to come in and remove yeah. our carpets yes well Yes, you, you further say, don't you, Jasmina, that you can't reach all the areas with your hoover uh, under the bed. That's often a problem. And that's really what you need to do. So if you really can't do that, then yes, you're, these moth bombs you're talking about. I think you probably mean the foggers, aerosol foggers. You can definitely use one of those. Um, and they, are, they work either by, you can either let them off and they all go psh for a couple of minutes and you, you leave the room and you leave it for a couple of hours and the fogger will settle everywhere and then it's a kind of works by contact so any pest that crawls over it or get, has any contact with it will die um or you can use it as topical so you could just spray it in certain areas if you want to i would test it on a small corner of your carpet to be honest because we don't know what whether the color dyes might run but if, if um, and just check the label most of the labels will tell you whether or not you maybe need to keep pets and cats and things out of the room if you're going to use them um but definitely worth a try if you're struggling bear in mind it doesn't get rid of the problem it won't stop them coming back it will just kill the ones that you've got now. So you do need to think preventively about trying to get under that bed for a bit more hoovering, maybe dropping your thermostat under there, get a cold air fan sometimes underneath to get a bit of air movement around, doing a few other things. Good luck with that. And I mean, I maybe I'll share my screen again. There, there were quite a lot of questions. If, I'm very happy to take further questions by email if people want to get in touch. I'll just share my screen. My email address is there on the right. I saw some other things in the chat. Um, if you want to follow up, please do get in touch. Perfect. Um, then, well, maybe since there are two minutes, let's take one very last one. Sure. Um, Joanne asks, what, measure, what measures do you take to prevent the introduction of new pest species to your collection? Oh, well, that's a great question. And I've sort of alluded to it already. We're pretty good at the environmental control relative humidity that does really help um the other the other thing is just i suppose it's vigilance and being aware of what you've got and if you're doing all the monitoring and you're documenting i i, I drum this into my house teams you need to know what's the typical pest profile in your house your history because it will be different whether you're in a big place or a small place a place with lots of collection or a big castle with not very much and just lots of stone walls so all of them will be different and all of them is fine and we know we will have insects and we don't hate them we've just got to keep an eye on them so be vigilant monitor 
document, look at your past records. So you've got a pretty good idea of what pest you'll get on this side of the building or that kind of the side of the building and make sure you have a cleaning regime that fits that. So if it's worse here than there, maybe you need to change some of your vacuuming and go that way and just, just be vigilant and use common sense and follow all our guidelines on environmental control and then broadly everything will be fine. <laughs> Excellent. Hilary, I think we should wrap up here. I must say, this is maybe one of the highest uh, numbers of questions we've seen in this talk ever so Great. clearly. There's Great. a lot of interest in learning from your experience. Thanks a lot for your offer of answering further questions via yes. email. Do get in touch, folks. It's been it's been great. And thank, thank you very much for having me. It's been I love talking about this stuff. It's a really nice opportunity. Thank you. The pleasure is ours, and I'll wish everyone a very happy Christmas. I'll see you all in the new year. Yeah. Bye-bye, folks. Thank you. Take care now. Bye.